um, at the be very beginning of the film, you have the little girl with the lollipop um, staring at the hazmat suit wearing uh, workers cleaning up the toxic waste, I guess. Um, and um, uh, part of your um, uh, discussion uh, touched on the fact that to me, I saw that as symbolism of cleaning up the toxic waste uh, and at the same time ridding the neighborhood of African Americans uh, as if African Americans were toxic waste uh, and disposable, I think is the term you use. Um, uh, and so I, I, I sort of, you know, picked up on some of these sort of uh, symbolic uh, scenes uh, throughout the movie um, in, um, you know, the relationships that the Black men on the corner had, um, uh, the sort of secrets uh, that Kufi was his name, uh, had held about himself, uh, not feeling a a real place within that group if they all knew because of their rhetoric uh, of uh, machismo and masculinity and so forth. Um, uh, the displacement of elders or the, the way that elders um, uh, were portrayed in the movie, uh, the street singer, you mentioned the street preacher who's not necessarily an elder, but the singer um, to me, that we kind of reflected of holding on to this San Francisco culture uh, and being, you know, the movie The Last Black Man in San Francisco. He may have been the last Black singer in San Francisco, one who uh, uh, felt real dear and held on to that um, musical culture. So there were a number of different things that, that, um, uh, you know, takeaways I had, and I was writing them down, um, you know, it's reflective of the decline of the Black population in San Francisco that you also touched on with Jimmy's father selling the house in the 90s and, uh, and that probably happening over and over and over again uh, as the Black community declined and the um, uh, uh, democratic I mean, excuse me, demographic shifts uh, in population uh, there in San Francisco, but we can look across the nation and see in some of our urban areas, the decline is a black population. I mean, look right here in Pittsburgh, um, where people are trying to find their place um, in this city as the city continues to develop. Um, and, um, and where do these, communities that love tradition, that love, that they feel themselves as part of the history and culture of the city, but that may not be the way that developers see it and so forth. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And you mentioned that um, Jimmy's father sold the house, but I want to clarify that it's suggested in the film that he lost the house um, because he, as unfortunately Kofi uh, remarked that that last night that Jimmy saw him, he um, was addicted, right? She, he was addicted to crack. So we can also think about the crack epidemic, the war on drugs, and also how that devastated um, local black and brown communities um, in San Francisco. So there's all of that, all of that is wrapped up in there. But, um, but no, I, I totally agree with, with all of your observations. I mean, even looking at the little girl and the, the guy in the hazmat suit, the street preacher also keeps talking about purification, right? And again, what does it mean to purify urban space, right? Well, that means you get the things out of there that are considered a threat to progress and profit. And that has historically not only been um, Black communities, but other minoritized communities, LGBTQ folks, poor, working class, homeless folks, right? The idea that the homeless people are the scourge on the city, not homelessness itself, right? And so all of these, I mean, gentrification is certainly considered a process of purification, um, although we typically um, understand it in development terms. 
that's for sure. So I'd love to get us thinking about um, what it means to belong to a place, because I think that's a, a question that sort of hovers over the film throughout from beginning to end. So what does it mean to belong to a place? It's a, it, to me, it's a very tough question to answer um, because it seemed, at, at least for me, that the type of answer I would give um, the story in this movie kind of says, oh, well, you may think that's the answer, but that's not the answer. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I thought was um, kind of interesting is family. And, um, you know, although we may look at Jimmy's family uh, as uh, fragmented, um, but he did have a loving aunt who herself saved a lot of the family things from the house uh, and kept it all these years and was sort of, as she mentioned, sort of waiting for him to come and, and, and get it and do something with it. Um, uh, but then there was the, the, you know, the fractured relationship he had with his dad. And um, again, this whole um, uh, masculinity uh, interfering with the father having any ability to really understand uh, his son. Um, and instead, he uh, was very critical of him, um, challenging his manhood, um, and but not really seeing what uh, Jimmy was trying to do. And you know, and at the end of the movie, Jimmy says, "You know, I knew my grandfather didn't build this house all alone, but as you mentioned, you know, it may have been the last real home he had." And that in itself is cause to kind of rescue it um, and try to um, uh, build something that, that he may have thought was very valuable to him. And that was home and family or rebuild uh, home and family. Um, but um, to me, that's what I think of when I think of community. Um, I think of family. Uh, or families in in the community, um, and uh, and all sort of uh, living their life, but there's a sense of collectiveness uh, to that lifestyle. Thank you for that. I actually, you sort of got at a question that I also wanted to ask, which is, did the revelation that Jimmy's grandfather didn't build the house did that change your feelings about his story his claims or the whole storyline at all i'm sorry i keep going back and forth with the mute button uh, for me it didn't really change it um because um again i go back to the point that it may have, for Jimmy, convinced him more of how important the house was. Um, uh, but the fact that he knew his grand, he, I mean, he actually knew his grandfather didn't build the house, even though there were others, the real estate person, the uh, Segway tour guide, all knew the history and done their research on the history of the house. Um, but that was sort of irrelevant. Um, it's what the house meant to Jimmy's family, Jimmy and his family that seemed to be the real history of it. And the fact that he was willing to do everything that he did to you know, bring the house back to life. Um, uh, but there is one question in, in the Q&A. Uh, it says, I was really struck by the lines spoken on the bus where Jimmy says, you can't hate it unless you love it. Do you think homemaking must involve some negative feelings toward a place? I mean, I, I think so, right? We, 
I think it kind of reminds me the way we, in the way we talk about our civic responsibility to critique even America, right? It's like, if you love the nation, you've got to critique it. I think if you, if you love something and you get to know the ins and outs of it, you're going to see the, the great, the beautiful, the parts you want to keep, as well as the parts that are not so great and want to change. And so I think that when you're really making a place a home, you, you're you coming to a deeper understanding of it that allows you for a real kind of critical, but also generative understanding of where a place has come from or in terms of how far it's come, what, it, what the real deal is and, and how far it's got to go. I guess we all kind of um, probably have had the experience where you know, our hometown or somewhere we live for a long time, uh, it kind of wears on us maybe. And we begin to only reflect those negative things, you know, as if, as the saying goes, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence uh, when it's actually not. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I kind of like the fact that, um, uh, you know, he had plenty of reason to hate San Francisco. Um, and yet uh, his disappointment did not lead him to feeling that extreme hatred that the two women uh, were expressing on the bus. And I think they mentioned East LA is the place to be or something like that. <laughs> I don't know about that, but... Um, uh, here's some people in uh, East LA are probably saying we're full. Don't come here. <laughs> yeah. uh, here's a comment from uh, uh, Emily, who says we all need something to believe in. I think when he was in the group home, his memories of the house and his closeness to family is what kept him going. He longed to return to the familiar. Oh, that's a good comment. Uh, what do you think about that? Absolutely. I, that's something that occurred to me as well, you know, that house, that, that physical structure standing on that corner was probably one of the only constants in his life. I mean, his parents, he had really difficult relationships with them. Um, his aunt, his beloved aunt was out wherever she could afford to be far out, um, you know, from, from the central city, but no matter what was going on, that's a place he could ride by every day and remember what it felt like to be safe and secure as a child. And I think a lot of a lot of folks can probably relate to that. So thanks, Emily. Uh, the other thing, um, uh, in my opinion, I don't know if uh, many of our viewers like old houses, but uh, I thought it was just a wonderful house, a gorgeous house, Victorian house. Um, I'm a former architecture student from way, way, way back in the day. Um, and so I still gravitate toward uh, craftsmanship. And that's what you see there. So I, when he was on the balcony and he was talking to the Segway tour and he's mentioning everything, the scales, you know, uh, the siding looking like fish scales and, and all the, the molding and, and the archways and, and everything he's talking about. Uh, he's only talking about the exterior at that point, um, really. And, um, uh, but it's, it's, you know, uh, to Emily's point, you know, it's it's familiar, but it's also a place where, I mean, you have to recognize that this is a gem. It's not just where we live. It's actually a real gem of residential architecture. Um, and with the price tag that was placed on it, I think they said $4 million, um, uh, you know, is indicative of the, the, uh, contrast between Jimmy wanting to be there and own that place and take care of it and love it and everything, uh, and the reality of the real estate market uh, that he and people who look like him have basically been pushed out of the real estate market. Uh, here's Thank another you. one that said, you mentioned the Hill District in your introduction. Can you draw parallels between the gentrification of San Francisco and our own city in Pittsburgh? 
Absolutely. So I think gentrification holds a, it's a similar narrative across the country, but I think the scope and scale depends a lot on um, where the city is located in the global economy. Right. And so when you think of San Francisco is very much a global city because of its location right on the coast there at the port. Again, Silicon Valley um, is right there in the Bay Area. So that means just the, the amount of capital and the speed of viciousness of a place like a San Francisco or like a New York or an L.A. for that matter is going to be a lot more severe. Right. But. I mean, you have this, the similar ideas where you have the, the 70s, um, many of, uh, you know, you have white flight, you have the middle class tax base leaving the central city for the suburbs and undeveloped or, or yet to be developed areas of the city. And then you have these poor minoritized communities really become concentrated in these cities. And so the, the city governments are asking, okay, well, how do we get money? back into our cities? How do we lure the middle-class tax base back? And gentrification, investments in real estate and things of that nature become um, crucial. Um, and so, you know, again, tech became, or tech and um, providing incentives to companies to establish um, themselves, establish headquarters, out, uh, corporate outposts and, and offices and things of that nature in these cities, um, that is certainly, um, what you see there and here. Um, and again, you've got, you know, those histories of, of migration, you have those histories of race and class and, and power, and how all of that interacts also means that certain communities often are especially vulnerable to the changes that gentrification brings. Um, so um, I think that is probably, I think those are some strong parallels. I hope that that answers your question. But on that note, you know, of course, I think uh, some people are trying to brand Pitt as a future, as, as a current and future tech hub, hub. And so, you know, you see the Google, you see the Duolingo, and I haven't been around for long, but I know those are the signs, right? And so I would also love, you know, we have one more question and we might not get to answer this, but I would love to know what you all think, um, where you think Pittsburgh is going to be in five to 10 years, given that, you know, the city government and business officials are brokering these deals with, with tech companies, Right, because places like Silicon Valley are almost like overdeveloped. So those companies and companies that can't expand the way they like to in those places are seeking out the Pittsburghs to gain a foothold. And that's going to have um, a wonderful impact for some, but a difficult and devastating impact for many of the most marginalized um, residents of Pittsburgh. Yeah, with the few minutes we have left, um... I'll attempt to address your question. Um, in five years, five to 10 years, um, I think it's gonna be a, a battle in Pittsburgh because some of the prime real estate, we talk about the Hill District a lot, um, but um, Homewood is another area that gentrification has come to Homewood to a certain degree but not to the extreme that we see in some of the other communities uh, like the Strip District, um, uh, East Liberty. Um, and, you know, the, 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 some of the signs for me is when they begin to change the name of the community. Uh, when I moved here in 2002, I got to know East Liberty. And now, you know, you hear about East Side and all this type of thing. That to me was the, was a flag for gentrification, and the oldest, uh, the oldest private, trick in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, private streets and so forth. So, so those types of things, um, uh, I think. But in five to ten years, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with, if there's going to be further development in Homewood. Um, but there was one more question that wanted to know where did Jimmy go at the end of the film. I think that's up for us to imagine. I mean, the, yeah. the boat the boat didn't look like it was going to get him too far. So I hope he stayed in the bay and didn't go into the ocean because I don't know if he's going to make it all the way, you know, yeah. across the Pacific. But, um, you know, he's, he's looking for an adventure. And I think, yeah. you know, maybe he'll go somewhere for a little while and then give, give the bay another try. Or maybe mm -hmm. he's just going to, you know, find a place that he loves and, and make a new life there. But I think that's, 
I think the director intends for us to, you know, imagine and, and discuss what those possibilities might be. And I think I, that's one of the questions that I get probably most often, where do they go when you're, when mm-hmm. the people are displaced, they don't just disappear or vanish, right? Even though it may feel like it, where do they go? So, yeah. That's great. Well, we just got about one more minute. Um, you want to make any last statements or comments? I just want to express gratitude to you all for sitting through that two hour movie <laughs> um, and, and sticking it out with us and, and your excellent questions. Thanks again, Sam, Dania, Phoebe and the tech team for, for helping this to go through without any hitches. I appreciated it very much. Well, thank you for bringing such clarity and insight and scholarship uh, to the discussion.